and I am late. I know I'm late. So forgive me. I've been tied up all day, and believe me, it was a fight to get here, but I am here. Thank God for that. <clears throat> and the beauty of it is, I'm able to fellowship with you all. That's what it's all about. Hey, in between our talk tonight, I'm going to be answering some questions by email and clarifying. Because I like to, when people ask me pertinent questions, certainly those that... <laughs> some things that you guys have sent me by email while I'm talking. Today we're going to talk about two kingdoms, not just one, but our Father's kingdom, right? And the beast system. No need to talk about the beast system if we don't know what the Father's kingdom is about. So we're going to be talking about some contrasts between the two, right? One that certainly exists right now one that's on the way in fact in daniel it says in the days of these in the days of these kings this is daniel 244 uh it, it shall the god of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people in fact it's for his people but it shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever that's daniel chapter 2 44 and what that is is the everlasting kingdom now that was established through christ so let's put uh, we're going to put the evil folks on notice here lucifer and his kingdoms that the kingdom of god will never go away you're not going to rid this world of the kingdom of God. It will eventually consume all other kingdoms, right? That's why in Revelation it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So you got to put them on notice. Hey, guys, I know you have your way and your beer, this, that, and the other in the world. But it's going to be consumed by the king of a kingdom. That has no end. Now, knowing that a kingdom is going to be consumed, well, where should you spend your time? In the kingdom that's going to be consumed? Or the everlasting kingdom and its ways and its principles, which are established by Christ? Hmm? When are we going to begin to live by that in, an, in, in freedom? In absolute freedom. You know what true freedom is? I'll tell you guys what freedom is. Freedom is no longer being bound by sin. That's what freedom is. Freedom is. Now, many people say, well, some sin is fun. No, not really. It takes away from your life. It seems that way, but it eats away at your life every single day. And true freedom and true liberty is to be rid of bondage. And bondage, all too often, is something you can't see. And Things that you can't see always work in the background, in the shadows, small things. People are looking for the big sin, right? But we forget the small things. Thank God for the blood of the lamb, correct? <clears throat> Thank God for the blood of the lamb. But to rid yourself of sin, right, is to, well, let's just analyze something. This goes with the kingdoms. We're going to analyze something. Many people in their own lives, they'll say, well, you know, I know how to do this. I know how to do that. I know what I'm doing. Right? Have you ever met someone like that? We've been like that ourselves, right? Haven't we done that ourselves? Somebody says, well, what, you, do you know what you're doing? You say, yes, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. A problem comes up and we say, hey, I can fix this. Right? And we're supposed to transition into a new creature, correct? Here's, here's the dilemma that we have. See, when you step into a new kingdom and it operates by pure principles you all lay down your life of the old kingdoms and the old man and the old ways and sit still in the new kingdom and piece by piece learn and adapt to the new way not to bring the old into the new and that's what people attempt to do they attempt to bring the old into the new and this is truly why you have secular demonstrations in the church right many people now guys listen we all come from different backgrounds and everything else I guess you could call me very old-fashioned very old-fashioned let me tell you what I mean by that you know how people are out there and they're dancing in the churches and this and the other right well 
here's what I say. I say that is bringing into the church things of the secular world. Even some of the brand new gospel music is secular by nature, right? And here's the, the, the word of God is holy. It is separate from everything. And so I just personally, I, I, I wouldn't do that, right? I'm not going to condemn anybody that does it, but I would never approve that. I wouldn't approve that because God's word is sacred and holy to me. So are the principles he laid, for our, laid out for our lives, right? I don't give excuse to certain things that I do. I told you guys a long time ago in COT, the first breaking I had was with music a long time ago. Harmless music to listen. I didn't listen to music that had curse words and all this stuff in there. It's harmless, right? But what it was doing was playing on my mindset. It would enhance emotions. When emotions are enhanced, you'd begin to say, well, I'm, I wish I had that. I wish I had this. And I found out one day what it was doing. Guess what I did? I threw away every single piece of music I had. That was the end of that. <clears throat> Walked away from it. Refused to do it. Went right to the word and pressed my way through. Right? Because anything that takes, um, that enhances your emotions and causes you to miss something, causes you to, to uh, you know, you sit and stare out the window. If it causes you to want something back in your life, you're, you're messing up. Because we, being the new creatures, should not want anything back in our lives. Right? Unfortunately, a lot of ministries, well, that's what they talk about. You know what they talk about? Going into the past and saying, well, you know, I've heard the term, folks. All of what the devil stole from you, and this is what it said, all of what the devil stole from you, you're going to get it back. Well, let me tell you something. He didn't steal anything from me. And everything I lost never belonged to me in the first place. I don't know about you. I don't want anything back he was able to take. I don't. I really don't. If he was able to take it, it was not mine. Because he can never take anything that's yours. Has he taken has he taken your lips off? No. Has he taken your eyeball out? No, he has not. Because it's yours, right? It's yours. Has he truly taken anything of yours? Let me, let me tell you something. If something belongs to you, then you'll have that thing. If something does not belong to you, it's going to be taken. I'm telling you the truth. So he has never taken anything from me. This is called a new walk in Christ. Right? Not the old walk. Not based upon the old ideologies. Not based upon trying to find balance with the world. Not based upon bringing the garbage of kingdoms in the world into the sacred and holy word of God, but to function as that new creature in Christ. And it says, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. When your mind is renewed, new things are placed in your mind. By the way, that renewing of the mind is, is the spirit. A renewing or a quickening of the spirit, which means you are filled with new things. Not trying to bridge a gap between the new and the old. The old man is dead. I am not going to resurrect him. He's dead. He's gone. That means if that old man had enemies, right? That's the old man. That has nothing to do with me. If that old man had friends, well, that's his fault. That's his, that's his thing, not mine. I'm a new creature in Christ. It, as being a new creature in Christ... I'm not looking for everybody to like me, but when it comes to the word of God, I am really looking for people to be reviled, saying, well, he just says the Lord's prayer too much. Well, he just, you know, he just hangs on every word of Christ. Well, that's right. That's what, that's what, because it says we would be reviled. People would separate company from us because of him, right? I don't want a bunch of people to run to me. I don't want that. So did they, the false prophets who came before us. How about that? How about, see, I don't want those. That's in, that's in the book of Luke. I don't want to be like that. I want the prophecies of Jesus of Nazareth. How many of you know that Jesus spoke prophetically? He did. All the time he spoke prophetically. Everything he spoke was prophetic. Do you all know that? Most people don't know that. They think prophecy is a prediction. It's not what prophecy is. If, if, let me give you an example of prophecy. It's very simple. You ready for this? If you tell us 
you're going to wake up at 9 p.m., right? Or 9 a.m. in the morning, right? You just told a prophecy. And when you wake up, that prophecy is fulfilled. Now, what did you do? You didn't predict the future. You told us what you were going to do. That's prophecy. Jesus told us exactly what he was going to do. Jesus told us what the Father was going to do. He's not predicting anything. He told us what the Father has planned. And he will do everything he said he will do. It does not matter if mankind believes it or not. That holds no balance with me. See, if mankind does not believe it, that's not my problem. That's their problem. Because... God is going to do it anyway. They don't have to believe. That's their relationship with Christ. Not mine. I'm not responsible for their relationship. I'm responsible for mine. If they choose not to hear, then they won't hear. Period. I'm not going to press the issue. I don't hate them. I'm not going to talk about them or anything else. If they don't choose to hear, they have not heard. They may hear from somebody else either way. It's not my problem. See... We have to have our walks authentic because are you truly ready? Are you truly, truly ready to really meet the Lord? Now think about something. He's coming. He's going to be sent by God himself. And he's going forth. All the stars and the sun, the moon, everything else is going to withdraw the shining. There's a day coming only known to the Lord, not day or night. Only known to the Lord. When he comes, all this wickedness and iniquity will be consumed. He will destroy it with the brightness of his coming. He warned us, and he said this phrase, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her plagues. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. Now, why would he say that? He didn't mean come out of that physical location. Because I'll tell you right now, the Babylonian system is worldwide. It's not in one geographical location. That's foolish. Every single ancient nation carried a spirit. Israel. Who carried that name Israel? Hmm? Who did? Who carried the name Israel? Do you know who carried that name Israel? Do you know? Do you know the story? Do you know who carried that name, Jerusalem? Do you know what those names mean? We had people back in the day who wrestled with angels. Do you know that? And their spirit, their mindset became that sacred place. And that's something. Because not that it was named after a man, but the man's name was changed to complement something that was already established by God. That's right, Jacob wrestled with an angel, and he would not let go. He wouldn't let go. and t That means nothing was going to stop him from reaching a point in the Father he wanted to reach. Thus, he has that name, doesn't he? He also has characteristics, right? My goodness, are you truly ready to meet him? Because he's on, things will change. How can things not change? Listen, when the Father sends the Son, upon its going forth, everything will withdraw its shining. Out of deep reverence and respect, because the Creator will get up to send His Son. Uh, let me say it again. The Creator will get up when He rises on His throne, that is to move and send His Son. Everything's going to wink out. So much for science. He is coming. Are you ready? Now, there are two systems in this world. One, Jesus said to overcome. The other, we were to find. We find the kingdom of God in the very mindset we adopt from Jesus Christ. But if you're full of your own ways, how can you ever take in the mindset of Christ? How can you have the mind of Christ if your mind is full of your own ideas? This is your true dilemma. See, to drop your own mindset, you have to actually trust in the Lord. I can't qualify. Listen, I would lie to you straight to your face if I said, Oh, yes, I trust in God. 
But then when something happens, I'm a nervous jerd. Right? That wouldn't be true. So guess what the Lord has been doing? He has effectively collapsed what we thought life was, and he has given us a new one. See, by losing our lives to him, we have found life everlasting. Now that needs to be defined in your mind. Many people hear that word life everlasting as something in the future. They don't know it began upon their conversion. How many of you know that your life everlasting began when you said yes in the heart, in the soul, in the mind to Christ? How many of you know that? Yet, we walk around like what? Dead people. Isn't that funny? We're, honestly, let me tell you the truth. There are a lot of Christians who walk around like zombies. They walk around defeated and sad and everything else. They do. We're, we look like the zombies, and the world is just living it up. You know why we look like zombies? Because we read the words when Jesus said, hey, you're going to go through this. He spoke prophetically over our lives, and we said, oh, yes, and we kept reading over that, right? We just read over that. He said it was going to happen, and then we get upset when it happens. Isn't it funny? How can we read the prophetic sayings of Christ when we see these things will come like trials and tribulations, and then we get upset when they come? Don't you think we have to correct that? If Jesus prophetically tells us something, and that prophecy is fulfilled upon our lives, why should we ever get upset? That's a dilemma inside the church. Let me tell you why, though. Here's why. Many people know of Jesus. Many people heard the name of Jesus. Many people are curious about Jesus. Many people are called. But the chosen, well, that's a different matter. Many are called, few are chosen. Why? Why? Because everybody's not going to believe. Everybody's not going to trust. Everybody's not going to lay their lives down. I mean, all of their lives. Everybody's not going to entrust God with their entire life. There are parts and aspects of people's lives they don't trust God with. Now, let me tell you something. If you don't trust God with aspects of your life, this don't be scared. Jump out of your seat. Don't point at me. Don't send me emails either. If, if, you don't, if you've not submitted portions of your life to the Father's kingdom, then that thing in your life, are in the kingdoms of the earth. That means you're still in Babylon. That means it's still in you. And if it is in you, you're going to drag it around everywhere you go. You did not come out of her. You didn't. You're taking it with you. Now what's going to happen to those who refuse to come out of her and the Lord came in 50 minutes, what do you think would happen? Because many people say, oh, I, I would be saved. Let me, let, me, let me tell you something. Did you, in all truthfulness, today do everything Jesus told you to do 100%? Did you? That means you were mindful in every conversation, every action, everything about your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Were you? That means you didn't think for one moment he was not listening, not seeing, not with you. Did you really? That means every thought you took captive that was not in line with the principles and precepts of Jesus Christ. That means you applied his word to everything in your life. Hmm. Because if you haven't, there's still filth inside of us. Jesus gave us the opportunity to come to him, to get rid of it, and you know what we do. Here's what we do. We say, well, you know, I need time. No, yeah, look, you need time, huh? One thing I learned about that, many people say that in the beginning because they don't want to do it. See, when you reach somebody and they say, well, you know, that's going to take time, that means they don't want to do it. Because let me give you an example. If, you're, if, a, if we were all in a building and it caught on fire, I mean a hot fire, you're going to run out of the building. You're not going to say, well, I have to sit here and think about it, and it's going to take time for me to figure out what I'm going to do. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to run out, right? Why would you run out then? But you wouldn't run out before. 
Because if somebody just said, well, you, you guys have to exit the building, everybody takes their time according to their own timing. Building catches on fire, everybody's gone. Why? Because of the heat and the pressure. So, in order to get us to move, he turns up what? Does he not turn up the fire? Hmm? He turns up the fire. Why? Because we have so many excuses within ourselves. We will not move until the fire comes. We won't. We just won't do it. We came to Christ when the fire came. When the fire left, we drifted again. And then the fire turned back on again. If you want to ever have the heat cut down on your life, stop turning away from them. Stop thinking you know it all. I don't think I know it all. I, the more I learn, the more I know I don't know. How about that? The, the more I read the Bible, the more I understand how much I never knew in the first place. And to me, that's awesome. That's exciting. That means the world is dying within me. And if it's dying within me, so is the flesh dying within me, and the causes of the flesh are becoming no more. My eyes are open wider. Hearing is acute. I don't desire things anymore. See, we do what we want to do. But now we have reached a crucial and critical time. Other generations have had choices where they could take a long time. Ours is different. Let me tell you why it's so different. The timing of things now are about to get very stressful. Just, I mean, don't be shocked about it. It's going to get stressful. Right? It's going to become stressful. When it becomes stressful, well, that's when people get angry. That's when the love of many is going to wax cold because iniquity abounds within people. And what that means is this. I want you to think of a scenario. When, 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 have you ever, there was a time when you have either been sick yourself or you saw people sick or they have been in pain. And they lash out at people, correct? A person that's sick or in pain, they lash out at people, right? Many people use that as an excuse. Some people in, the, in here, they can say, well, yeah, I've done that. I've done that. I lashed out at people when I did that. Pregnant women do it all the time. They may, they may do the unthinkable to you. Not all pregnant women, right? But that happens. Why does that happen? Because you have no more comfort in the body. So listen to me. When the comfort is gone in the body, people get evil, don't they? Don't they get evil? When the comfort is gone in the body, they get evil, right? Don't they get evil? When the comfort is gone from the world, all the nice folks you see out there are only nice because of comfort. When they lose their comfort, they're going to be like ravening wolves, animals. They're going to be hateful and bitter. They won't care who they shoot. The only reason they're kept calm is because they're comfortable. Let me, let me drive this point home. Many people, even listening to me, the only reason they have any peace is because they're comfortable somewhat. If you have a roof over your head, and you're protected from the elements. You have a type comfort. Because if you were outside and homeless, then that would be a different situation. If you had no roof, no RV, no car, no anything, and you were sleeping in a cave, that would be very different. So when the world loses its comfort, people will become what they truly are. The truth is, when the body is injured, when it's uncomfortable, the reason why a person starts lashing out is because it was already in them. Because of their comfort, they held it back. Well, you can hold many things back when you're comfortable. When the comfort is broken, you find out who a person really is. Now, I can say this truthfully. There have been times I've been very sick in my life. I was always nicer. I'll tell you why. I was injured too quite a few times. I was still always nicer. Let me tell you what happens. I got, I, I became nicer than I am right now. I'm really passionate and nice. I'm kind of backwards, right? But, but I become passionate and nice. It, it's because I don't want anybody 
to go through the pain I'm going through. I don't want anyone to endure the sickness that I endure. And I'm, 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 very, um, I'm very keen on looking for those folks who have gone through what I've gone through. I have great compassion for them because every single sickness, every single everything that has happened to me, every injury, everything, I'm very sensitive to. And I become very nice. In fact, when I'm doing my worst, I want to serve more. And isn't it funny? Because that's my place. That is my place of operation. My place of operation is not to be well all the time. Right? Not to be well all the See, if I were just absolutely 100% in perfect health and everything was going right in my life, that would be a tragedy. Let me tell you why. I would be out of touch with those who hurt out of touch with those who are in deep need. Out of touch. I would be out of touch. I could ha show no compassion to another person. The only reason we have compassion towards others in truth is because we have gone through it. I don't want to go back to any comfort. See, the point is, I don't accept comfort. Because if I accept comfort... I can no longer see all the truth. I begin to operate in a different way. I assume things. I will assume you're okay. But when I'm not okay, I'm sensitive to the slightest comment you make. When I'm not okay, I'll listen to everything you say. When I'm not okay, your well-being becomes my personal business. And what is that? Isn't that how we're supposed to operate according to the word of God? Hmm? Isn't it? Aren't we supposed to be in touch with our brothers and our sisters in truth and not this phony face? Right? To pray for them and say, well, you get better and then leave. And you're off to doing what you do, having no thought of the conversation that took place. No, listen, if somebody comes to you and they're hurting, if they come to me and they're hurting, I'm, I'm not doing too well. Because I share in their hurt and their pains and their lack and everything else. And believe me, that causes one to petition. Listen, if you are hurting in lack and pain and things of that nature, and you're talking to other people and they are too, then you know how to petition. You cannot petition for anybody of something you have not gone through. You won't have the heart to petition. You'll just say some words and forget about it. That would be like a family. Can you imagine a family who says, I don't know what I'm going to do about food in 24 hours. And you say, well, I'm going to pray for you. And right after you pray so they can hear it, you go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Or you go to a restaurant. You feed your own face. Are you kidding? I'm not joking with you guys when I tell you that people call me crazy who know me. Because when a person suffers... I tend to do it with them. I'll do it with them all the time. When people are in lack, I fast a lot. I do. Not, to, not so anybody knows either. Let me tell you what it does. It puts me in their shoes to a degree. I will deny myself to petition for somebody else. Do I have the ability to go out and get food? Yes. And I won't do it. I won't do it. I, won't do it. I do crazy things like that. Do you know why? Because I know prayer works. But you have to be in a position to petition. I didn't mean to make a rhyme. That just kind of popped out. But you have to be in position to do that. In position to do that. Why do you think you're here in the first place? Are you not here to show love, God's love to your fellow man? Didn't the Lord tell us to love your enemies, love your neighbor as yourself, love everybody else like you love your own soul? Well, let me tell you what that means. That means if you're sitting in your house in this winter time and you put on a, a, a sweater, do you take thought of your neighbors saying, well, maybe they need something? Do you look at those folks in the chat room while you're eating and then begin to pray and say, Lord, show me anybody who has not eaten. Do you do that? 
Sometimes you have the means to comfort another. Sometimes you have the means to mourn with another. You have the means. You don't have to have money to do that. But you can certainly comfort one another. Now, the kingdoms of the world are not like that. But they operate by the principles of Christ. They can't accept the person of Christ. How many of you know that? People in the church operate by, they know the person of Christ, but they often deny the principles. What is that? That's called discipline. Discipline. These are the contrasts between the occupants of the kingdom of God and truth and the occupants of the world. And when the comfort's gone, you're going to know who every single occupant of the world truly is. Many people will just simply say, well, I just... I have to survive, and they'll throw the Bible away. A great falling away, oh, you're going to see it. It's already happening right now at different levels. There's not just one way people abandon their faith. There are many ways people abandon their faith. And through persecutions, you often find out who a person is. That's why persecutions come upon the body of Christ. Because it purges them, and it tries them. It also qualifies them. Many people don't talk about that. Persecutions qualify you for what you do. You will never be qualified without persecutions upon your life. And you've already had them. You've already had persecutions. Right? That's why Jesus said, bless to you. When men are reviled by you and say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. You have to be persecuted so that the truth of you may be known. And when you're in your deepest struggle, I'm telling you, that's who you are. Now, what do the kingdoms of the world tell you? That's not what they tell you. They say, well, we, we understand you were just stressed out. No, listen, nothing can come out of you unless it's in you. And when you get in a struggle like that, once in you comes out, it was always in you. Let me give you an example of that. If you were in a struggle... And the only language you know is English. Are you going to start speaking Japanese? No, you're not. You're not. Because you only know English. There's no Japanese in you. Right? So you're not going to speak it. But let me give you another example. If you knew Japanese fluently and you were stressed out, you may speak in both English and Japanese. Why? Because you know both languages. It's in there. So what I'm telling you is that if it's not in you, it will never surface. That means the next time you get upset, when you're hurting or something like that, lash out. That thing was within you. Instead of ignoring it and covering it up, you ought to say, oh, oh Lord. Oh, oh Lord, I've recognized something. Do like David did. Some of the prayers, some of the psalms are about David. Many people think all the Psalms are about other people. That's not so. David saw the iniquity within himself. He saw that within himself. What is that, Oki? Michael, it's time for a break. The critters am saying, hey, it's time, and I've gotten the real words, but I don't speak. Oh, Oki, what in the world was that? Okay, anyway, because I can see the chat room. I don't know what that was. Anyway, so there's a contrast here. Now, in the kingdom of the beast, which is right in front of your faces, I'm going to share some things with you so that you don't, let's just say for some of you, continue in that kingdom or be beguiled by that kingdom, right? Don't want you to be beguiled. But you should be able to observe that kingdom without it moving your left or right. You really should be. You really should. But you have to observe it first. You have to observe it first. How many of you know that Lucifer is behind the kingdoms of earth? How many of you know that? Anybody know that? But it is the Father who allows a person to sit at a throne. How many of you know that? The Lord does this. He, listen, Satan cannot do everything you think he can do. Satan has not been responsible for everything people have said he's responsible for either. You see, we forget that when we began, we were the children of wrath. 
And we found Jesus of Nazareth by actually him opening our ears. He drew our attention. And then we began to observe many different things. But most of the damage in our lives came from us. It came from us. Lucifer sets up a system. Now it's your choice whether you serve that system or not. If you serve that system, or if you love that system, then you love Lucifer's handiwork. You love the world. And the world, if you love the world, the world's going to love you, but the Lord will have enmity against you. A strong separation against you he will have. When you love, and you know what's so funny is that the kingdom of the beast, the dragon, copied himself in the earth, changing the mindset of man over many years, setting up his authority. He already set up his seat, right? He has power spanning the globe right now, but only for those who observe his kingdom or worship his kingdoms. Worship means observe, voluntary observance. Most people give voluntary observance to their respective nations. But they won't do that for the kingdom of God. No nation on this earth is equal to the kingdom of God. Remember that. Never forget it. Never make an excuse for, for saying it or anything else. The kingdoms of earth are substandard always to the kingdom of our Lord. Always. But when you begin to give voluntary uh, observance to these kingdoms in the earth, you know what you're doing? Revelation 13. That's what you're doing. Revelation 13, 4 says, And they worshipped or gave voluntary observance to the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? who was able to make war with him. Now, let me pause. I'm going to talk about this for a minute. How many of you think that means a military war? How many of you thought that meant a military war? How many? Type of one, if you think that means military war. I know I just sparked off an idea in your mind, and many of you are going to change it. But mo for the most part, many people think this is a natural war. Right? When the Bible says we war not against the flesh, but the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, what does that word imply? I'm about to tell you. The reason, now you have to look at the context of Revelation 13, 4. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is likened to the beast, who is able to make war with him. First of all, they worshipped the dragon, didn't they? The world did. The world worshipped the dragon. How in the world, how does the world worship the dragon? Have you ever seen anybody in the public's eye worshipping the dragon? So how did this happen? How can the world, the world's not going to do that, first of all. Not in the context of what we think about. They're not going to worship the dragon. They're not going to do that. So how did they do it? I'll tell you how. Worship, again, is voluntary observance. They observe everything man-made. Did you guys hear me? It's that simple. They observe everything man-made. They have a moment to pause for everything man-made. Everything man-made is their substance. Let me tell you what has happened. Many Christians, many of us, we say, Lord, Lord, I believe you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this and the other, which is, which is awesome, right? To thank him for things. But do we believe him? Let me tell you what has happened. Now, if I told you that you believe man over your father, many of you would say, no, I do not. If I told you you trust man over your father, many of you would say, oh, no, I definitely do not. But the fact is, many of us do. And let me share with you how. You see, if you stopped getting money, you would make excuses to get money. You'd say, if you're a Christian, you'd say, well, you have to have substance to eat with. 
and you have to obtain it, your mind automatically goes into this paradigm of supporting things in man. So let me ask you a question. Are we trusting in, in the Father? Are we trusting in Christ? Or are we trusting in man? See, man has proven all of his stuff to us. God requires faith. It is easier for the flesh to receive of man because we can see it, touch it, and feel it. It's tangible. But it's very difficult for the flesh to ever have faith. It's easy for the flesh to have faith in man because we can obtain it. Not so with the unseen things. So I ask you again, is our trust truly in the Lord or is it in the earth? Is it with man? Is it with the kingdoms of this earth? There are many people talking right now saying, well, they're not listening in Washington and they're going to be the reason that the world is this, that, and the other. No, they're not. So what they're implying there in that statement is this. If they don't physically change what these people are physically changing, they see no resolve. That's not having trust in God. It does not matter what mankind does. The Lord is going to do what he does regardless. If it was one person left on the earth, the prophecies would still unfold. How about that? Right? So what I'm telling you is this. Oh, oh and then... And then, so they're not openly worshiping the dragon, but they're worshiping the power behind the power. They're worshiping the ideologies and ideas. Every time this, the space shuttle used to go up, what did everybody, oh, it's a marvel. Oh, we're just so proud. That's of the devil. Let me tell you how that sounds ludicrous, right? But it's not. Let me explain. When you're proud of what you did, that you place it over something that somebody else did and it puts you up on a pedestal, you're in pride. God resists the proud. Many people don't even know that. When you elevate your own doings, it is written that God resists the proud. He will abase you. Right? If you're proud of your own accomplishments, God resists the proud. Not to mention you're denying a basic principle of Christianity, which is this. It is the Lord that does the mighty things through us, not us. Isn't that something? So if he does things through us, and it's by him that we're doing things, why would a person be proud of their own accomplishments? Think about that. If it is his power that is allowing or disallowing all these things, we can't be proud of ourselves. That's what Lucifer has taught mankind. Now this, listen, this conversation is really like peeling a scab. Can you guys tell? It's like peeling a scab. This is not the mindset that people think in every day. People don't want to touch this subject. They don't want to touch it. Because they'll say, well, you know, it's unpatriotic and this. And let me tell you something. They may even call you a communist. I mean, I got both Christians and Muslims mad at me. Are you kidding? Because I'm saying too much about Christ. They say, well, you're just totally against prosperity. Well, of course not. To prosper in the kingdom is wonderful. But don't store your treasures up on earth where they can be eaten by moth and you're going to lose them anyway. But store your treasures in the kingdom. Right? Because where a man's treasure is, there his heart is also. That means their heart is in the world. They think I've lost it. Like Christians don't like me. Muslims don't like me. Hindus say I keep making fun of the Mahabharata. I had one guy where he said, hey, that's serious stuff, and I'm going to do an incantation. They're going to come and do this, and they're not going to come. I said, buddy, listen. God is over all of those. They're nothing but copycats and illusions, manifestations of something very old and bound. And I have power over them through Christ. That's what I told them. I have power over them through Christ. Do you want to know why? Because the Lord said, all spirits are subject unto you through his name. 
So guess what? As far as Allah, as far as all those little dudes and Shiva, I don't fear that statue. So what? They got a statue. That's their, They're doing that to themselves. But you have power over Shiva, over those characters in the Mahabharata and the Vedas. You have power over Allah. Why? Because they're spirits, and they're all subject unto you through the name of Christ. Now, who in the world? That's what they should really say in this presidential election. And then you find out, <laughs> you find out who is who then. They're not going to say that. They won't ever say that, neither will those in mainstream churches. They're not going to say it. Why? Number one, they're scared. Well, don't say anything against Allah, la, 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 because, you know, that, listen, that's a spirit that's a spirit. All those characters, Shiva, and, and, and all those in the Mahabharata and the Vedas, and all those in the ancient Sumerian texts, of which people just, they lied about, gave a false premise, and they're being laughed at. Even scholars are being laughed at. Because those people know what they did to those scholars back there in that age. They know the secondary text that they found. They know the crystals with the writing on the inside that's impossible for mankind to do. All those things are ancient spirits that have no power over us. Lucifer has no power over us. It said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. If he's going to run when you resist him, what kind of power is that? I'm telling you, he has no power. They are pranksters, tricksters. They may get loud, make a few noises, make an object move. So what? You can make them flee. That's the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ that will consume all the other kingdoms in existence. Did you hear that? All the kingdoms in existence will be consumed by the kingdom of God, which is already established. And as we believe, so it is established in us. We carry that kingdom wherever we go. That means wherever you go, you subdue spiritually. You're the reason Lucifer cannot raise his head. Not yet. There must come a falling away, for, uh, falling away first. There must. He doesn't have enough strength and power to do that. If he flees, if too many Christians are resisting him by staying covered in the blood of the Lamb, by not giving in to him, He's being resisted on every side. He's fleeing. He's going all over the place, running away. So when the falling away happens, he no longer has to flee. He functions. Do you, is everybody understanding that? Because, listen, I have to tell you, I get a little, I never get forceful at times, right? But you've got to know by the word of God who in the world you are. These things have no power over you. So stop giving them credit and begin to take responsibility. Take the responsibility. Never assign blame. Take the responsibility. You're the child of the living God whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And that kingdom will absorb and crush and put into pieces all these other kingdoms. Stop giving him all that credit. When Jesus said, it is finished, it is done, it was finished. You didn't hear of anybody talking about Satan and Lucifer manifesting as he did with Jesus again. That was the last time you heard of him. You heard of devils. You heard of demons. But you didn't hear of Lucifer. People are making things up. All these folks who sit there and look for ghosts, right? Please don't be fooled by that. You can never do that job because you wouldn't find anything because they're subject unto you through the name of Christ. They're going to hide from you. They never have to hide from their own. They don't have to hide from their own. Don't be fooled if people sit there and say a prayer and then go ghost hunt. Now, how dumb is that? that that's not smart people out there. You don't pray. You don't pray and then go find and do the very thing Jesus said don't do, that the Lord said don't do. 
You're not here to entertain people with spirits. Jesus told you the truth. You don't need to go and find it. That's not your grandmother, your lost child, or your loved one speaking to you. There are people in the services all over the world with these little spirit boxes. This craft is prospering. Did you guys hear me? Craft is prospering. Witchcraft is prospering. It is, you know what that is? Hmm? Do, do you guys know what the Necronomicon is? That's the instructions on talking with the dead. That's what they're doing. The abominable thing is what the world is interested in. Are you guys hearing me? They like to consult with the dead. But they're consulting with demons. They're practicing witchcraft. And here's the bad part. Witchcraft in this world, not in one country, in the world is prospering. Because everybody wants to ghost hunt. Now it's normal. See, you're not even offended. If there's a show that come, comes on that says ghost hunters, you're not offended, you're not moved. You're just say, oh, how so sad. How sad. Because it's normal. That means it's all over the place. If that would have happened when I was like 17, 18, or 20, 30 for that matter, if I was 40 again, if that happened, the whole world would have been in an uproar. They would have said, no, not here. Certainly in America, they would have said, no, not in this nation. You take that stuff out of here. But let me tell you something. When they began to legislate religions, which is not the government's business, and said, okay, well, we're going to have, here's what they did. Let me tell you what they did right in front of your faces. They have separation of church and state, correct? Right? Basic, basic thing right there. But they're telling you that you can't, you cannot put Jesus anywhere. Are you, what kind of stuff is that? They're also telling the church of Dodo, uh, excuse me, Lucifer, that his church can be everywhere. This is what they're doing. That, what, what do you mean they're doing? They, have, they shouldn't do that. The government cannot legislate anything of faith. And the people have a right to say, get that garbage out of the, company, out of the country. Take it out. Do you see how that works? Right? They can't make any decisions but they made all the decisions. They can't be inclusive with Christ in the government. But they can tell everybody else, hey, you come and talk about your, your, your Allah. And, and you let this person speak and then let him say uh, uh, Muhammad's name. I'm telling you the truth. But one person that says, Jesus of Nazareth, a lawsuit is against him. Folks, you got to wake up. You got to wake up. You can't ignore these things. Oh, yeah, Buddha. All the, they let everything in but Christ. That tells you, the, the, listen, the proof is in the pudding. If they won't let the name of Jesus be spoken, but they'll let people talk about the Mahdi, people talk about Muhammad, they'll let people talk about Buddha and Muda and anybody else you want to dream of. And certainly Lucifer, every time Lucifer's mentioned, you have people with laughs. It, but it's a wicked laugh, like I'm going to get you laugh. But you don't hear them talking about Christ. Why? Because it is the spirit of Antichrist. That's why. Is that clear enough for you? Hmm? There is no nation safe from that spirit. Any, any. Listen, uh, Angela and I were talking this morning, or, or today, and, and she was talking to me about first uh, John all right first John chapter 4 if I remember correctly and we were just talking and I, it says beloved believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they be of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world hereby know ye the spirit of God every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of 
Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. And then we talked about the actual, the one, the spirit. Now, notice it didn't say the mouth. It said every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, in order for a person to confess this, they believe it. And if they believe it, they're doing the things that Jesus said. And if they're doing the things that Jesus said, the fruit is in their life. You will never confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is of God when you don't do anything he said. You can't confess something you have never done. How can you confess to something you've never performed? Hmm? Is that clear? Right? That should be clear to everybody. In order to confess and say, yes, I'll confess, it is proven to you. And you are doing it. But the ones who don't do it are not confessing him. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. It does not matter if they say he is the son of the living God. It matters if they're doing it. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord? And you don't do what I say. What don't do? Why do you call me Lord? And you're not doing what I'm saying. You see how that works? So it makes you kind of recalibrate that definition of Antichrist. Doesn't it make you calibrate it? Now I find it strange that the spirit of Antichrist is a little more than what people had bargained for. See, it's not the black and white that you once thought. It's been at work all this time. And there are many people that are not doing. Not doing those things that Jesus said to do. And it's been at work for a very long time. Even during the time. Of the, this is not new, but it's growing. So again, in Revelation 13, they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying who is likened to the base who is able to make war with him can i tell you something by the spirit now i know theologians and everybody else they have their say with the scripture but i tend to 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 when when the lord will show me things sometimes and it doesn't matter if you think it's from the lord or not what matters is if i believe it's from him i'll operate by him anyway when i see this i don't necessarily see an army I see something else, right? Let me, let me explain something to you. Imagine yourself, you're trying to make it, right? Trying to make it from day to day, and uh, you don't have favor on you from the world. You keep getting rejected at every door. So after 20 days, you go back home and you say, well, I just can't win. I just have to just admit I can't win. That, that's, that's a person saying in their hearts, well, who's able to make war with him? You can't win. Who's able to make war with him? Are you guys understanding what I'm saying? That's a defeatist attitude. See, I read this before in a different way. And the Lord showed me through the Spirit something else. I tend to believe from the Spirit, not from my puny pea brain mind. Because the Holy Spirit is never wrong. It doesn't guess. It's not going to make mistakes. It's not going to guide you in the wrong direction either. So I'm seeing this and I'm saying, wait a minute. That means people surrender to this system. Because they're never able to fight it. Right? I hear people say this all the time. They say, well, you can't go against the government yourself. You need more people. And then they get more people and they say, well, it's still not enough. It's just too powerful. You can't do anything. Just pray. Because they're saying in their hearts, who's able to make war against them? Folks, are you understanding what I'm saying? The average Christian won't do a thing because they feel what they do won't mean a thing. Do you understand? But why are they saying this? Because they're saying, well, I can't go against it. 
I can't do anything myself. That's the same thing as saying, I can't make war with it. I can't resist it. I can't do anything. Do you understand now? It's in the hearts of the people of earth. And, and so guess what they do? They end up going along with it. Why? Because they're held in bondage by it. They're held in bondage by the world. See, if you break free of the world, you begin to see these things. If you depend upon the government, I'm going to go there. If you depend upon the government, listen to me close. You still belong to the Lord. How about that? That's all I want to say. You depend upon the government, you still belong to the Lord. Believe it or not, every soldier depends upon the government. Believe it or not, every retired person depends upon the government. Believe it or not, believe it or not, right? Everybody depends upon the government because half the stuff you eat is subsidized. How many of you know that? Hey, it's a wreck. It, it really is a wreck. It's a wreck. See, you can either follow the world's way or understand that the world is cooked. And you are to walk and establish kingdom principles wherever you go. Everywhere you go, you represent the kingdom. Stop representing man-made things and represent the perfect thing, which is the kingdom of God, of which you were called to do. If you were not called, you would be one of those in the world. You're not called to support earthly systems. You're called to be a part of your father's kingdom. If you want to support the nations of the earth and what they're doing and help them out doing what they're doing, I doubt you would have ever been called to the Father. But you were called. That means you carry the kingdom with you that overcomes all other kingdoms. Who knows? It could be you. to step right in Washington, D.C. and they give you all the attention in the world. See, you don't know that. Until you begin to walk in the kingdom. It is you who are the world changers. You are the ones who carry the creator's spirit called the Holy Ghost. Oh my goodness. Do you understand who you are? No need for moping. How are you going to mope and close a royalty? That's the funny part. You're in the kingdom. The kingdom is within you. And you're moping. You're troubled by things man can do. And you're not concentrating enough on what God has already done. How can a person, let me, let me ask you a question. If a person really reflects on what the Lord did in their life, if they really did that, there'd be no situation they can face that would trouble them again. If they really meditated on what the God did in their life, it wouldn't matter what the situation is. Because your awe of the Father, your heart towards Him, your love towards Him, would outweigh any situation you'd ever go through again I'm telling you the truth it's when we don't remember how he delivered us and we get nervous fearful have a loss of faith and when that happens those agents from the world come straight to you it's a funny thing in it isn't it a funny thing? Let me tell you a cycle. I mean, let me give you a device to the enemy, of the, the adversary here. Whenever you begin to doubt your brothers and your sisters and the Lord all at the same time, Satan, Satan's little emissaries and agents and people of the beast kingdom, they will contact you and begin to talk to you every single time. They will solidify and support your dislike and your casting away of anybody. They will add doubt to doubt as soon as this happens. See, when you're spiritually built up, they can't do anything. That's not when they come to you. They come to you when you're spiritually losing it. Then you get a phone call. Then you get, the, you get a contact then those who were mean to you are nice to you because you just stepped out of the kingdom. Folks, can anybody relate to this? Can you relate to this? This is a device of Lucifer himself. 
These are agents of the kingdom. So what I'm telling you is this. You back away from the principles of Christ. And if you're ever embraced by the world, they will surely kill you. Surely. See, the Lord said, if you go back, you're going to die. And with the world, if you go back to the world, they wanted to kill you in the beginning. See, Satan does not like you. You're too messed up to become a part of his kingdom again. So you'll have to just go kapoof. He wants some of you gone, but he can't have you. He has no power to take you. The only thing he can do is make you give up on yourself. And the only way you can give up on yourself is to turn away from the Father. All your strength and everything else is your faith in Jesus Christ and your abiding in his ways. So we have the beast kingdom already set up on earth. King Nebuchadnezzar being the head of the statue. See, many people miss this. King Nebuchadnezzar was the head of the statue. The statue is ever present in the earth until the everlasting kingdom comes and destroys it. Right? You remember in Daniel 2.37, when Daniel's talking to the king, he says, Oh, thou, O king, are a king of kings, for God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. That's what Daniel told him. Daniel told him that. So he being the head of gold and all other kingdoms inferior to him, that means they're all modeled after him. Didn't we even capture... Th- King Nebuchadnezzar was the head. What is the head? What is the head of anything? It, the head is the true representation of the body. Right? Is it not? Is Jesus is the true representation of the body. Jesus is. Jesus is. The body by itself is dysfunctional. Nothing's coordinated. But the head is the representation of that kingship. So King Nebuchadnezzar, all the other kingdoms on earth, even up to this day, are inferior to King Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Because he, he is the head of all the kingdoms that came after him. So if you want to know about the beast system, you have to know about King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. It was told to him wherever the birds fly, wherever the cattle graze, wherever the fish swim, wherever man walk. King Nebuchadnezzar, that kingdom is given dominion over the earth. They operate by the rule of law. Just like we do today. But all other kingdoms are inferior to King Nebuchadnezzar until the everlasting kingdom comes in. Right? Do you guys get it now? So when it says, when it's talking about Babylon to come out of her, and when it's speaking about Babylon in Revelation, how she's going to burn in one hour, the world is going to do that. Don't look at one geographical location. The world will endure that. You can see this by the trumpets. All the green grass burnt up on the earth, and one-third of the trees burnt. Now you know that happened to the entire earth. Right now, the kingdoms of earth, what do we follow? Draconian rule. See, when it's split up into little sections, you had Rome, right? You had Greece, but all these are part of the Babylonian system. All of them are part of the Babylonian system. We missed it. Okay, who has a question? I can't believe it's 844. Are you, is, are you kidding me? Mayor, you have a question? I, I just saw that. I just saw that. Mike, was there another change of sorts? Some have a feeling something has changed. More peace, yet some weeping for those who still don't see pouring out of sorts. So people are feeling more peace? Is that what you're saying? But still weeping at the same time? Right? Mayor? Wrong or right? Am I right or wrong? It's like a type of peace, a change, but some are weeping, yes. Well, Mayor, let me... Let me uh, Can I tell you guys this, especially for the women out there? Women are the ones with the weeping spirits. Just so you know. 
Not the men. Not the men. Women are. Bradley says, Mike, do you think Obama will set up a Secretary General of the United Nations? I can't comment on that. Can't do it. Can't, can't do that, Bradley. I, um, I believe that uh, some allegiances concerning many government folks have already been made. I believe at this point it's a game to them um, because what is set in motion they'll not turn back from. They won't. I also believe something else. This election that's taking place, right? Because Obama will be replaced. This election taking place, we're going to have a president and then somebody, somebody will step up to power. Listen to me close. We're going to have a president, but somebody's going to step up to power because they'll have to. They're going to have to step up to power because of the great divides in just about every single land mass out there. Right? When this happens, America will fight for its life. But it will not fight for the reasons they fight now. It won't happen that way. There is a destructuring take place, taking place right now. Right? That's why they're so silly about the elections. And I'm, I, I don't mean to offend anybody, but you can tell yourselves some of what's happening with the presidential elections is disingenuous. It really is. It's not, it, it's not a very well-devised um, smokescreen, so to speak. It's almost like it's not real. It's an impossible scenario, right? It shouldn't be that way, which should automatically let you know that the true leaders of this nation are busy with other things. They're dealing with a dividing problem. There are loyalties at risk within this nation. Loyalties at risk. That means great division is in this nation. Now, that division won't be over. And it won't, will not be over until both sides stand up. But hear me, they, vote, they, they know this. It's going to be something in magnitude that will cause all men to begin to fight for something else. Folks, listen to me. Humanity itself will begin to fight for something else. That's how bad things will get. Whether or not Obama's going to the United Nations... I'm not qualified to answer that. I can't say this, make a statement, though, that the world and a lot of the conspiracy theories that you heard concerning uh, civil unrest around the world, you'll see it. You will see it. And there will be damage to the land masses. But remember this. The Lord's coming is to make peace with the elect. Every single one. Stop listening to Hollywood. Our God is above every human being and every spirit. Right? What we call supernatural is the basis of his operation. It is not a big thing for him. We are his children. Therefore, supernatural things will return to us, although you have not seen them now. If you think you have seen supernatural things now, you really haven't. You will be kept. He will keep you in supernatural ways. I'm telling you now, if you have no substance, see, this is going to, this is, this is it, folks. Though some of you cannot prepare for anything. I'm telling you, do not be afraid. Whatever you're unable to do, the Lord will do for you. He will not fail to do that. He won't. He won't do it. You will be kept. You've been kept up to, you've been kept up to this moment for a purpose, for a reason. He's working on all of us right now for a reason. And it will get shaky. Just remember, everything must be shaken. So that only that which cannot be shaken will stand. It rains on the just as well as the unjust. But you belong to the Lord. So the task here is to make sure 
that your salvation is complete. That means every single day. Every single day, make sure that you're ready to meet the Lord. Not on your terms, on His terms. See, that's why I told you to watch. Because if you're watching, you're purging yourselves. You have to think sometimes and say, what if Jesus showed up in two minutes? And then begin to think about what's undone in your life. And that's what you take care of. You're going to have to think that way. Or you won't make the right changes. Look at other people in your life and say the Lord's coming and they don't even know it. And then you'll do well to talk to them. And you won't force anything down their throats. Because you know if they get cast away, it's for eternity. And if you love them, you'll have all the patience in the world for them. Never expect anybody to conform on your time. But you must conform to Christ on his terms. And within the time he gave you, you make sure you conform 100% today. And, and please hear me. Please hear me. Do not ever leave anything off for tomorrow concerning the things of your life and salvation. Don't do it. Of any time in history, we surely don't have tomorrow. We have to be ready to face him today. The world will soon go empty. And it will be nothing like we thought it would be. It's not going to happen like people thought it would happen like. Imagine over the course of five months, half the population of earth is gone. No explanation. No finding them. No nothing. Imagine that. Gone. Just gone. Little by little. Out from under the noses. Of everyone just gone. Imagine that. Are you ready for that? Imagine a day with no children on the earth. Imagine that. See, we're sitting up saying, well, it's going to take me time to forgive this person. You don't have time to forgive someone. That is absolute disrespect to the Father. He sent his son looking upon us. I mean, we're filthy. And he sent his son because he loves us to forgive us. Yet we can't in turn forgive something earthly somebody did. We blasphemed everything in heaven. And we can't forgive anything. We can't forgive a deed somebody did to our bodies which are never going into the kingdom in the first place. Listen to me. Your body is not going into the kingdom. Jesus did not come to save your body. He came to save your soul. Not your body. Why do you think it was written? It's not what goes in a man that defiles him, but what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. Now, what was that? Why make that statement? Because it's not about your body. People are spending, you know what, it's so foolish. People are saying, well, I, I need to eat organic. Let me, let me clue you in on something. Every piece of anything that you have is tainted with stuff in the atmosphere. Unless you can go to another planet, your food is tainted. Stop buying bottled water saying this is pure. It is not pure. It's tap water from another location. How gullible are we? Do you breathe air or do you produce your own oxygen? You breathe the air. Do you know how much stuff goes into the atmosphere? How many life forms are floating around? Viruses? Do you know it's all in your food? We have GMO rain. How can you avoid GMO beef? You grow your own garden. Is it protected from the rain and the soil that was already there? See, this is what I'm saying. You're, you're doing things trying to save the body. Make sure your soul is anchored in the Lord. Anything they enter, let me, you know what, can we, can I, I'm going to make this spiritual comment. Anything that enters, I'm going to speak for myself, anything that enters my body 
When I pray over my food, the substance will change and it will be used for edification of my Lord and for the, my walk in Jesus Christ. It could be poison. It will have no effect. I'm not going to purposely drink it, but the Lord can change all of his creation and all of man's creation. We just need to say, yes, Lord, I will follow you and do those things he said and stop worrying about saving your life. In so doing, you will find yourself losing your life. Have we, we have become foolish, nitpickers, not believing in the power of the living God. Nothing that can destroy your walk in Christ but you. You're the one that has a choice to say yes or no. Nobody's GMO food is going to do that to you. You can eat something poor nutrition. I guarantee you pray over it. And it will be life-saving substance to your body. All you have to do is bless the food for the purpose of the kingdom. See, these things, people these days find it hard to believe. I, I hear people all the time, well, you know, my, my uh, grandparents, they used to eat pork and stuff all the time. They were just so healthy. My grandfather smoked for years, didn't have a problem. Well, they had one thing in common. They prayed over their food because they knew if they didn't, they could get sick. That's what they did. We don't do that. We pray out of routine. They prayed because they knew if it was not blessed by the Lord, anything could happen. That's why. Yes, they were much more healthier than we are. Because guess what? In trying to save ourselves, we're killing ourselves by eating man-made things out of balance. And then we depend on that, not the Lord. Oh, I got to go into the grocery store and get this as perfectly balanced. Well, stop praying over your food. And stop eating for your own enjoyment. Stop doing things for your own enjoyment. Do things because you need to survive to serve the Lord another day. Feed your body according to your walk in the Lord and you'll have no problems. But if you're eating just because you like to eat and you like the taste of the food and this, that, and the other, you're missing the whole point of sustenance. You're missing it. You're missing the whole point. Because a long time ago, they ate because they, were, they, they had to eat. Only when we became, only when we became self-aware that we could sit as kings, did we begin to eat for taste. Mankind did not eat for taste back then. Yes, they carried salt to kill certain flavors in the meat. Yes, they carried wine. Because wine is good for your bloodstream and your body. And people have lost their faith. Pray over your food. Nothing will by any means hurt you. Pray over your food. Pray over it. Paul had that problem. Peter had that problem. That, that Paul didn't want to eat what the Gentiles would eat. Peter, no, Peter didn't want to eat what the Gentiles ate. So he has a dream. And you know what the Lord ultimately conveyed to all of them? Do not call unclean what I have made clean. Because he said he saw a bunch of unclean animals on a white sheet or a white blanket. And the Lord said, do not call unclean what I have called clean. That's what he said. See, people have had too much idle time on their hands. And they're trying to perfect their own religious beliefs. And that all they have to do is adopt the words of Christ. That's why they flip to the Old Testament back, back. Right, the, there are the Ten Commandments. Then there are the statutes and judgments. They go back to the statutes and judgments. You, we don't take people out and stone them anymore. That's what the blood of the Lamb is for. The Ten Commandments have been fulfilled in the words of Christ if you do them. But the judgments, are they not voided by Christ because of his blood? 
That's why we don't kill someone when they sin the first time. We can now go boldly to the throne of grace. Jesus has become our high priest. There are many things that have been fulfilled, but people want control over another. Listen, and then you have folks out there who are barely alive. And they say, hey, don't eat this, don't eat that. But they're the ones suffering. I, how can you be barely alive because of your diet and then teach your diet to me? And have they forgotten about the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is real. How about that? How about if you have a question about, see, if you provoke the Lord and say, well, I'm going to swallow this poison. Well, you, you just provoke the Lord. And you're going to pay for that. But if you're starving, and the Lord provides something to you, and somebody else thinks it's unclean, they can be sitting right beside me. I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to gobble it up after I bless that food. That's what I'll do. And then there are some times I will not eat at all, based upon the sufferings of my brothers and sisters, and based upon what I need to, because sometimes I have to be in the right place for my brothers and sisters to actually pray for them. I cannot effectively pray for you all the time when I am full and comfortable. I'm telling you the truth. I will impose and chasten myself to get an answer because I have to be sensitive to what you're really going through. Yes, I have eaten bugs. Lots of bugs. Those are unclean because we had to eat bugs. And I sure did eat them. And I prayed over them too. And even though it may make a goat throw up, they were they worked. They gave me energy. That's that's no joke. How many people have eaten a cricket, right? They taste like grass. Correct? I've eaten one, but it gives you energy. See if it's it listen to me. That's why if it's not a necessity for sustenance to the body, your body can do amazing things. Do some study on the body. There's little you can eat that your body cannot process. It has a difficult time processing processed stuff. Because processed stuff has polycarbonate materials in there. Plastics and everything else. I'll eat tree, I eat tree bark too. Anybody ever boil tree bark? You ever do that? Anyway. You can make it taste like turkey. You can't. It tastes just like turkey or something like that. But what I'm telling you is this. We, we can't walk away from the spiritual truths of our Lord. We need to get back to the spiritual truth. This time that we're heading into, the boat is headed directly into a storm. Now, if you don't want to be on this boat, go jump in the stormy ocean. But the boat is sailing. And no matter how bad the storm gets... We're always going to invite the Lord in on the boat all the time. But the boat is the vessel of which we must travel till we get to the point of the full redemption when we walk over the water and find ourselves on the other side. But we're in the boat, and I'm not going to complain because I already know about the storms. I know the waves are high. I'm not going to be downcast in countenance because I got on the boat in the middle of a storm, and I said, oh, there's a storm. The storm is not ending. The storm is not supposed to end until we're on the other side. When we're on the other side, there will be no more storms. Don't be downcast in countenance because of the storms, but understand the difference between the kingdom and the beast of which men are now worshiping. And they say, who is like an, who can resist the beast? Who can make war? against? Who can go against the beast? They're saying that already. Take note of the spirit of Antichrist that's already been released into the world, but also take note of just who you are and how that everything spiritual is under submission to you. Understand that Lucifer has no power against you. Resist him and he will flee. All of us resist at the same time. He's going to get scared. Flee means to run away. Flee means to run. Just so you know. That's almost like running for your life. Flee, that means run for your life. Why? He runs for his life away from you. That goes to show you that if we obey God, Lucifer is the one in trouble. How about that? He has to flee. Or 
suffer the consequences. That's why he runs. It's not really you. It's you keeping the word. And he can't do anything against the word. Haven't you noticed? When you obey, you become one with the word of God. And Saint can't do anything against the word. He runs from the word of God. He has no power against the word. Therefore, he has no power in you. And Jesus is what? The manifestation of the word of God. Now remember, just one more piece. You have to be in Christ. He knocks at the door to come in. But ultimately, you have to make your abode in Christ. And in his doctrine, no other doctrine you should have but the doctrine of Jesus Christ. He said, don't have any other doctrine but his alone. He said, abide in his doctrine. That's what he said. That's what he said. And guess what? You do those things, you're already okay. If you set your heart to do those things and begin to do them, you're already okay. If you take the first step and you begin to do them wholeheartedly, you're already okay. Even before you complete all of it, you're already okay. Remember Daniel, as soon as he, as soon as he decided in his heart to chasten himself, the answer was sent from God to Daniel before he ever started anything. It's all about the intent and sincerity of your heart. See, if your heart is there, you're going to do it. That's all the Lord looks for. He sees your intent and your first step. And the answers are on the way. He's a good father. And Jesus, Jesus is the reason we even have a father like that. Because through him, we may now, we are now turned back to the father and the father to us through Christ only, through no one else. You didn't do it. Nobody else did it. Jesus did it because he was the first and obedient one. His beloved son in whom God was well pleased. He did not defy his creator. His creator being God, his father. Nor should we defy the one to whom our salvation comes. But listen to him. Hear him. Operate by what he said. Begin to believe him and not the world. And when you no longer worry, when you're no longer bound and burdened by the system of the beast, which is the world, you'll find yourself free and the Spirit of the Lord will be all over you because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is not, there is bondage and confusion. Remember that. I want to say God bless everybody. I know we were, oh my goodness, we're going to have to, don't worry, we'll catch up tomorrow because I was late today and it kind of threw me off. So I apologize for that. I want to say thank you guys for, for visiting the Council of Time, even though I was late. You're a beautiful family. Beautiful family. You guys remember that the power of the blood of the Lamb is real and so are you. So are you. Take note of the kingdoms in this world that they are not established in Christ time for us to wake up now the spirit of antichrist is all over the place they have kicked everybody out but they have kicked everybody out right of their little system and that everybody is us and jesus christ but they let every other deity in remember that one too please remember that one, so that you can see exactly who it is i know for some of you it hurts your feelings and it hurts you know it really gets mine because i shed blood for this country many times that's why I almost got upset with somebody that made a comment the Lord was with me on that day but it is what it is it is ultimately my treasure is in the kingdom and in Christ God bless everybody you guys continue to care for one another and thank you thank you thank you for being a family in COT Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. It really does. God bless every single last one of you. Stay tuned for Larry Bond. He's coming up next here on COT. He's probably already on.